Good morning. Glad y'all came to be with us today. Before we get started, I, I would like to say that we have a, 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 a new member, placing membership with us today. He's been here since October. Many of you golfers know him. It would be Thomas Butler back over here. If he'd stand, please. Or raise his hand. There you go. As, as we begin our, our worship service this morning, I want to bring to mind our um, uh, Luke, and, uh, no, and John. In John, the fourth chapter, where Jesus is talking to the lady at the well. And if you'll remember, he talked to her about a couple different things about bread that she could eat and water that she would drink where she'd never be thirsty or hungry again. And in her conversation back to him, she was talking about, well, you Jews think you have to go to Jerusalem to worship. I want you to notice what he says in 23 and 24. He says, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We hope that you've come to worship in spirit today, along with us. We're going to sing some songs of praise to God here in a few minutes. We're going to open up our mics here for, for prayers of praise to God in a few minutes. And Jody is going to bring us a lesson in a few minutes with words of encouragement from God's word. And then as we gather around this table in a little bit to remember God's only son that gives us spiritual and eternal life. Let's begin. Good morning. God be the glory, great things he has done, so lovely, well worth, and he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. This morning we'll sing, Be Still My Soul.
Great God and Father, as we come to you this morning as a unified body of believers, having been purchased by the blood of your Son, we would give you thanks. Thankful that we can be here to praise you, to thank you for the gift of your Son, to encourage one another, to show our love one for another and to be pleasing to you. Father, we know your word is alive and active. And as we endeavor to do the best we can to worship you in spirit and in truth, we ask that you give us the ability and the willingness to look to that word, to direct us in all things that we do. Be with those who direct us in worship this morning, that it will be in spirit and in truth and that we can be better for being here because of it. We're thankful for this group here. And we're thankful that we can be here in this place together. In just a few minutes, Father, we'll remember the death of your son, and we're so thankful for that. It is by his death that we can have a equally precious faith and to strive to make it to be with you one day. Be with us, Father. Let us be an example to the community around us by glorifying God and being Christ-like in everything that we do. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. And thank you for the home that we have reserved for us that will not fade away. And then, Father, as we conclude this prayer, we ask that if there is anyone here who needs to respond to your message this morning, that they do that without delay. And may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Forgive us of our sins and wash us clean, Father. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll use the words of this song to help prepare our minds in remembrance. We'll sing the chorus once after the last verse. <coughs> Oh, 
glad you're here this morning. Those of you that know me know that I love pop culture. I love movies. I love music. Um, but I love movies. In fact, I gave away over 400 DVDs because I wanted to stay married. There are some cardinal rules in pop culture that we generally accept to be true. One of them is the book is better than the movie. But there are exceptions to those rules. If you have read Jurassic Park, you know that book is pretty good, but the movie is great. One of the other commonly accepted things that we accept is that the original is always better than the sequel. And that there is no better example that that is not always true than the 1980 American classic, The Empire Strikes Back. You probably weren't expecting a Star Wars reference this morning. The reason uh, that I want to bring this up is for the uninitiated in The Empire Strikes Back, it's the second movie in the original Star Wars trilogy. And the reason I want to talk about that this morning is it contains one of the more iconic exchanges in movie history. And to give you a little bit of context, following his betrayal by a close friend, Han Solo is captured by the well-known heavy-breathing menace that we all know as Darth Vader. His punishment is to be frozen in carbonite. But immediately before this punishment is delivered, Princess Leia says something very important to him. She looks longingly into his eyes and she says, I love you. Those of you that have seen the movie know what comes next. Harrison Ford delivers one of the most... um, remembered movies, remembered lines in movie history. So immediately after looking into his eyes, Princess Leia says, I love you, and he looks back and simply says, I know. Now, as a man, I don't pretend to understand women. However, I feel pretty confident that that might not have been the response that Princess Leia was looking for. So why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up this morning at the Lord's Supper? Well, I want you to turn with me to to John chapter 21. To provide a little bit of context, we're going to flip down to to verse uh, verse 17. I think this is an important passage for us to look at because Jesus has limited time after his resurrection. And and in fact, this is, uh, we can immediately preceding this, see that Jesus has appeared to seven of his disciples. He has just finished breakfast. And then Jesus has this exchange with Peter. It says, starting in verse 15, it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter's response is simply, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus responds, Feed my sheep. Jesus asks him again, Do you love me? Peter, pretty clearly not getting the message here, responds the same way, essentially saying, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And a third time, Jesus asks Peter again. He says, Do you love me? And this time, Peter's kind of a little bit upset. And he says, You know everything you know that I love you. And Jesus delivers a similar message to Peter a third time, saying, Feed my sheep. And delivering a simple two-word message shortly below that, he says, Follow me. Princess Leia likely wasn't hoping for the response, I know, when declaring her love for Han Solo. And it seems that Jesus was looking for a little bit more from Peter as well. When Jesus asked him if he loved him three times, his response was essentially, You know. This was important enough for Jesus to address in his very short time post-resurrection. And sometimes, I think our living response to Jesus telling us every day how much he loves us isn't altogether that much different than Han Solo's response to Leia. When I hear Jesus in my life say, I died for you, sometimes my response is simply, I know. Sometimes when I... When I hear Jesus say, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, sometimes my life's response is, 
I know. I left heaven for your benefit. And sometimes still my response is just, I know. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 and 29 Tells us, it reminds us to do this. It says, Let a person examine themselves and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so, what I'd like for you to do this morning as we reflect is consider the ways that Jesus told you this week, I love you. But also consider what your response was. When Jesus said, I conquered death. Don't let your response just be, I know. When he said, I forgive your sins, I know is not enough. I hope that this week you'll consider that. And I hope this week that we'll find a way to do as Jesus asked to and to feed his sheep. Let's remember his sacrifice. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for your sacrifice. We're grateful for your death, burial, and resurrection. And Father, we are grateful for the bread this morning that as we partake, we remember the sacrifice and the cost that was paid for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, help us as we remember, as we remember that sacrifice to make a change in our lives. And that this week, we do more than just say, I know. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, as we continue our remembrance of your son's sacrifice, help us to keep in mind the magnitude, the magnitude of the decisions that were made that caused Jesus to leave heaven and to die on a cross and to shed his blood to allow us to have access to you and to eternal life. Father, help us as we partake of this cup to remember that sacrifice and to live our lives in a way that is, that is in some semblance worthy of that. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you weren't here last week, we had a pretty cool opportunity to, to hear from someone uh, that we support, uh, someone that we support another literal world away. Uh, Brother Surrender preached to us as uh, one of our missionaries that we support in India. We support missionaries in India, the Philippines. Uh, we have works here in the United States that we support in the prison system and other places as well. And for those of us that are members, it is our privilege to, to participate in the spread of the gospel both that way and, and in our own personal lives as well. And so as we have the opportunity to give thanks for what we have, let's also give thanks for what's being done and continue to pray for the efforts that are being done. Let's pray as we consider an offering. Now, just so you are aware, we won't be passing trays uh, as you're probably well accustomed to at this point. We have boxes in the back that you can, um, you can uh, contribute to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are blessed well beyond measure. You've given to us so richly, especially in the land and in the country that we live in, that we are eternally grateful uh, for, for the circumstances of our lives. Father, we are uh, incredibly grateful and humbled by the work that is happening in the Philippines, by the work that is happening in India, and by the work that is happening uh, through Brother Townsend in the prison system as well here in the state of Florida. Father, we pray for those works. We pray that uh, the monies that are collected today are, are used to further your kingdom. And Father, we just pray that in all things you bless the way that these funds are spent. In Christ's name, amen. The solid rock. We invite you to stand while we sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest strength, but only be on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock, I stand all other ground with a sinking sand. Good morning. So glad you came to be with us today. It's a pleasure to gather in God's house and to consider spiritual things. As has been mentioned a couple of times this month, the elders have uh, focused all of our attention on Sunday mornings to the missionaries and the work that they uh, are doing, the missionaries that we support. And uh, as Drew said last week, we uh, we're able to have Brother Surrender speak for us. He's one of the uh, elders of the church at Hyderabad and also preaches there in India. And uh, we also had Brother Russ Roberts, who lives in Jacksonville Beach with us. And Russ makes uh, regular trips. He and a group of men go over and uh, 
uh, work with those who are preaching over there in India and kind of following in the footsteps of his uh, father-in-law, Ed Harrell, who, uh, who did that for so many, many years. But uh, Brother Surrender did a, a great job of reporting to us, and one of the things that was so overwhelming between he and, and Russ uh, in presenting their message was the, the tremendous density of people that live in India. Uh, I mean, it, it is absolutely mind-boggling to try to consider uh, the numbers that he put before us. And so there's a great need for the gospel to go to India, and it's a wonderful privilege that we have, as Drew said as well, that, uh, that we have a participation, a part in that work. And that, uh, just to reiterate it, it is all because of you. Uh, it, it's all because of you. Every, every dollar that you put into the collection plate, I want you to know that some of that money is going to India to help support the preaching of the gospel there. Some of that money goes to the Philippines to help uh, in the work there. Uh, some of that money goes to Daryl Townsend and the work that he does in the prison system. And some will be going uh, to the Czech Republic. Uh, we had the week before Brother Bill Bynum speak for us. And uh, he told a story about how he had gone over to Romania shortly after the wall fell. Uh, and and uh, they were some of the first Americans to go over into Eastern Europe and begin preaching and teaching the gospel. Uh, what he didn't tell you, but what Melissa and I know because of knowing Bill and Nancy, uh, is when they went to Romania, they, they made the move to go over there and brought what they needed with them. And I said, so where did you stay when you first came? Do you already have something already taken care of? And, and Bill said, no, we stayed at a hotel. And I said, okay, so... How did you find the place that you ended up going to and staying at? He said, well, I was at the train station one day, and there was a guy there who said that he had a couple rooms available, and so he asked us if we wanted to come over and stay with him. Uh, I said, and so you did? <laughs> and he said, yeah. Uh, that, that's a tremendous amount of faith, to move over to a foreign country, be some of the first ones to ever go over there. And not even have a place that you're going to stay that you know of as far as getting there. But they have done a great job in the past. And we look forward to participating in that work when they move over in August and begin. So I applaud the efforts of the elders to put this in front of us and, and uh, uh, to get us to think about these things. So uh, I want to continue in this thought this morning. And uh, all of this, I think it all begs two questions. Uh, when we've talked about and emphasized supporting missionaries this month so far, is uh, why do we do this? Why, why do this? Why send some of our contribution, some of your contribution, uh, miles and miles away, halfway around the world? Uh, why do we do that? And then how do we do that? And so I want to open up the Bible with you this morning and invite you to do as well as we're going to talk about uh, that very thing. The first thing I would suggest to you is in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 as to why, why do we do this? Why do we support missionaries in their work of preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. In fact, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the non-Jew. So the gospel is for the Jewish people and it's for everybody else who's not Jewish. It, it is the gospel that has the power to save. So why do we do this? We do it because the gospel has that power within it. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we also learn that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the, the, the need is, is worldwide. It's not just this group of people, this kind of people, these ones have sinned, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then I invite you to turn to this passage in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. In Romans, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 9,
Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth that, Je- that, that uh, with the mouth that Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is rich, the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now listen to verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So we must believe to be saved, he says, and we can't believe unless we've been taught, he says, and we can't be taught unless somebody teaches us or preaches to us. And so the idea of what we're doing is all need the gospel. The gospel is the power to save men, and it takes preaching and teaching to go and do that. So we support men in places that we've never been. Anybody here been to India? Anyone? Okay. Uh, I haven't either. None of our elders have been to India. But we, we have confidence in these men that we know who have gone over and talk and teach and work with them. And they've come back and told us the very things that Russ was telling us about last week. So we support missionaries. The reason why we do this is because the preaching of the gospel is so absolutely vital to save men from their sins. So let's go on to and talk about how we do this. Uh, what I want you to know is that God hadn't just said, okay, so go do it, and not given us any examples about how to do it. The Bible is filled with different examples of how the gospel is to be preached and taught. So let me look at this first passage with you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians the ninth chapter, <clears throat> dropping down to verse 7 of this text. Bible says, whoever plants, whoever, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink the milk of the flock? Then he goes on to, to, to explain, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen that God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of his hope. And if we have sown spiritual things to you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, then even so more we. Nevertheless, we've not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat the things of the temple, and those who serve the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So the Bible teaches that one congregation, a local congregation, can support and pay for the preaching of the gospel within that congregation. We have a biblical example of a local congregation then supporting its own preacher or preachers. Look at Galatians chapter 6. The Galatian letter, the sixth chapter, and dropping down to verse six. It says, Let him who is taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches. So, so it's, a, it's a responsibility, it's an opportunity that the congregation has to support, pay for, or provide salary, as it were, for the local preacher. But there's also a passage, look at this with me in Philippians, the fourth chapter. Philippians, the fourth chapter, we also have a congregation now that is a larger or more, we might say, affluent congregation. 
and they're able to support several different preachers. Chapter 4, verse 10. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did, not, uh, surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to, be, and to suffer need. I can do all things, Paul says, through Christ who, str- who strengthens me. But look at verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again to my necessities. So the Apostle Paul says, I, I've been out preaching in different places, but the church back home in Philippi sent money for me to go do this, this missionary work of preaching. In fact, I would surmise that they supported different preachers. So you have one congregation supporting different preachers. But there's also another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians the 11th chapter where we have several congregations individually supporting one preacher. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 at verse 7. Did I, he says, commit sin in humbling myself? that you might be exalted because I preach the gospel of God to you free of charge, as he writes to Corinth now. Then he says, I robbed other churches, plural, or I took wages from them, he says, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, so I will keep myself. So Paul says, when, when I was preaching there in Corinth, I had other churches that were supporting me so that I wasn't a burden to you. I was able to, to receive support. I was able to receive support from you to provide for me and for the needs that I have. So several congregations supporting one preacher. And then look in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 13, we have the the heralded church at Antioch. It's a great church, a missional, missionary-minded church. In chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, it says, Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manim, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. It says, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So you have one congregation now sending teachers out to go teach and to to preach. Doesn't talk about financially supporting them, but sent them out to go and do this particular work. So, so we have examples of all of this, of a local congregation supporting its own preacher. You have one congregation supporting several preachers. You have several congregations supporting one preacher. Or you have one congregation sending out people to go preach and to teach. Now, I'm talking about from the collection or from the contribution that the church takes up. So let me add this. There, there's individual things... In Galatians, the sixth chapter, not talking about your financial, your own wallet, your own uh, uh, individual monies or savings, but what you contribute and what the elders have a responsibility for. It says in Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. 
And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So individual, your individual wallet, your individual purse, your individual money that you have, you have great freedom in what you can do and, and what you can support and how you can support those particular things. You might choose to send money to the March of Dimes, the Kidney Foundation, Cancer Research. Maybe you've been so touched by the work that hospice does, you want to send money to hospice. You want to support a school and, and send some of your money there, save the whales, nuke the whales, whatever, whatever it is, that, or, or the, the Barbershop Harmony Society, whatever it is. You can send your money anywhere. Anything that's going to be godly or scripturally based in the sense of a good person and a good example. So all of that's your money individually, but when the church collects a contribution, there are certain responsibilities and examples that we have. Now turn with me to the book of Acts again, because there's a warning that comes. In the book of Acts chapter 20, the elders of the church at Ephesus had come and they were talking with Paul, Paul was talking with them. In Acts, the 20th chapter, dropping down to verse uh, 27. Really, the thought begins a little bit better earlier, but we'll just pick it up at verse 27. For, he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole gospel of God. Verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So he's writing to, he's talking to elders, and he said, now, you're the elders, you're the shepherds, or overseers of a congregation. You have a responsibility, a weighty responsibility that sets upon your shoulders. He says, therefore, take heed to yourself, and take heed to all the flock, he says at verse 28. Then verse 29, for I know... I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in, even among you, not sparing the flock. You know, there's a warning that sounded there, that even among those who are the leaders in the church, those who have been appointed as elders or overseers in the church, Paul says, now, you need to be careful because, he said, I'm telling you, there's going to be problems come up even within the leadership of a church that's going to cause problems in, in the bigger picture of things. So let me just give you a little history, just a very brief history. The New Testament closes the pen of inspiration, becomes silent about 100 A.D., approximately. At that point, the New Testament has been completely written. And so all of God's Word is contained within there. Now, departures had already begun to come, as Paul was warning about in Acts chapter 20. But over the next several hundred years, departures grew and became more and more and more. Departures from the faith. Now, I would have you to know that, that nearly every single denominational church that exists today had its beginning in those next several hundred years. There was a movement known as the Protestant movement based upon a protest. It was the Protestant movement. that They began to, to build and make churches around certain particular teachings and beliefs that they had. And then in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, there was a major push, a, a movement, we might say, a religious movement that says, you know, we need to unify all of the churches. We've got all these different kinds of churches out here calling themselves by different names. We need to unify all of the churches so that they all speak and teach and practice the same thing. In fact, what they said we need to do is we need to go back and restore the original church or the first century church. And so their purpose and their design was to bring all the churches together, not just to tie them together, but to say we all need to go back to the one teaching that's found in the Bible. Well, I have you to know in the, in the 1830s to the 1850s, this restoration movement to restore the church 
The Restoration Church or Restoration Movement, was, they were the fastest growing religious body anywhere on the face of the earth. Talking about missionaries now, that's what we're talking about, teaching the gospel. The church was growing, churches, entire churches were abandoning their teaching. And they were stripping off the denominational names and saying, we're just going to be Christians, that's all we're going to be. And they became unified more and more and more. So during the 1830s to the 1850s, this fastest growing religious movement on the face of the earth, people were leaving and coming and being a part of this. They, they began forming little independent, impoverished churches many times all over the frontier land. But in 1849, even among those restoration churches and, and preachers and teachers, there was an idea that came up in 1849 that says, you know, we need to get the gospel out to everybody. We need to spread it worldwide. And this little church of 12 people and this little church of 27 people and this little church of 13 people, there's not a whole lot we're going to be able to do. So, so what we should do, we're, we're going to send our monies and pool them all together and so in 1849, the, United Christian, or the American Christian Missionary Society was formed. And the president that they elected for this board of, over the board of directors in this missionary society was a man by the name of Alexander Campbell, a man who had preached against missionary societies for years and years. But he changed. And this resulted in a huge split within the Restoration Churches. And growth stalled almost entirely. About 100 years later, the Herald of Truth was formed. It was by a group of people who said, we need to get the gospel out to as many as we possibly can. We'll preach it on the radio. And so they will collect money from all of these different churches. And then in the 1990s, the One Nation Under God campaign that was to send a flyer to every single household in the United States. You send us your money, we'll be the sponsoring church and we'll do this work. And it was a church in Cookville, Tennessee that decided to do that. The Herald of Truth was a church in Abilene, Texas. But here's my point. There's no scripture for that, but here's what we do. Here's what we do at Central. We support local preaching. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, turn back there again. 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, where we've got down to verse 13 and 14. Do you not know that those who minister in holy things eat the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake in the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. The church here at Central supports me financially. Colin, Wayne, Jared, and uh, beginning in another month or so, Jed, as far as preaching of the gospel and teaching of the gospel here locally. We have a scripture for doing that very thing. What we do in Philippians chapter 4, according to the passage we read before, we support six men in India who preach the gospel in different places there, and actually the elders are considering looking at some more who need some support there. We support one man who preaches in the Philippines, one man who preaches among those who are incarcerated here in the state of Florida, and we also support or will be supporting in just another month or so Brother Bill, Bill Bynum who will be in the Czech Republic. Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 16, we have the same scripture that we looked at before to validate what we do. Also this congregation is we have sent preachers and teachers out, sent Colin out to Barbados before to do preaching and teaching down there. Lisa and I have gone down on several occasions for the last 20 years, going down to Barbados to preach and teach. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Our pattern is the Bible. We're just trying to follow the Bible to the best of our ability and what we do in every way. But just so you know, 
whether you put a dollar in the collection box, a thousand dollars, or like the recent gift we got that was almost eight hundred thousand dollars from Sister Coward, that that money, some of your money, is going to support men who preach in India, one who preaches in the Philippines, one who will be preaching in the Czech Republic, and one who works among those who are incarcerated, as well as helping to support the local preaching and teaching here and the work that we do down in Barbados. You, individually, are helping to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, individually, are reaching people that you'll never, ever meet through the gospel of Christ and the missionaries that we support. You, through your contribution, are making a change in people's lives that is radically different from where they were to where they can be in Jesus Christ. That's the greatest news that I can share with you, that we are tremendously blessed here at Central. And the elders feel like, since we are so generously blessed, that they too want to be generous and support those who are preaching and teaching. So let me close with this. The very best news that I can tell you is you don't have to go to India or the Philippines. You don't have to be arrested and incarcerated. But we can teach you the gospel right here. And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then you can be baptized just like they were in the first century for the forgiveness of all your sins. Now, now why do we do this? Because your soul is at stake. Your soul is in jeopardy. And we don't want to see anybody lost. We won't see anybody go to hell if you can avoid that. And God says you can through what He's offered to you. What a joy it is for us to be able to extend to you heaven's invitation today. If you're not a Christian, we would invite you. We're going to stand and sing a song in just a moment. We would invite you to come down to the front and let us know that you want to become a child of God. You want to have your sins forgiven. You want to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Or maybe you need to come back to God. Maybe you did that in the past at some point and you've not been faithful, you've walked away. Your soul is the most important thing that you have. It should be the greatest value and treasure that you hold. We want to help you. If we can We'd sure invite you to come forward. Let us know how we can while we together stand and sing this song. Out of my bondage song.
place. Except Owen. I'm going to ask Owen to come up here. Here, come up here. I'm going to let you stand. I'll see. So everybody can see you, okay? We've got people coming in from all over to watch this. Okay, this is Owen Lynch. I know most of you know Owen. He's Matt and Kaylee's oldest child. And Owen's been asking a lot of questions about the Bible and about his relationship to God. And he's a little bit nervous standing up here in front of you a little bit nervous? A little scared? Yeah, me too. Okay, I understand. So I asked Owen, I said, so um, what can I do for you? Why are you up here? After he swallowed a time or two real hard, he said he wanted to be baptized. And so I asked him if he, if he knew what that meant. And he had to swallow a few more times. And, and he does know what it means. We asked him to write a letter, and he did, about his belief in his faith, and he's been asking mom and dad and asking mom and dad for uh, several months, actually. Um, Matt, how long y'all been here? Back from almost five years. Okay. Okay. So, the, yeah, the first Sunday, as I recall, he was trying out for the preaching job. He ran up here in the pulpit. Um, we were looking for a young preacher at that time. We weren't sure that young, but... Um, Okay, so Owen, I'm going to ask you, Owen, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Yes. Okay, yes, you said. And you want to be baptized, how come? So you can wash your sins away. Okay, we're going to take care of that right now. And his dad, Matt's going to talk to you for just a, a minute or two while we get ready and tell you a little bit more. Okay, come on, buddy, let's go this way. Um, so this is the youngest person Jody's ever baptized. So I, um, imagine there's a few concerns, um, due to Owen's age. Um, and this isn't something Kaylee or myself or Jody or any of the elders take lightly. Um, but those of you who know Owen well know that his heart and his mind don't work like a typical child of his age. Um, he, he's smarter than me in a lot of things. Um, through his classes here, his talks at home, he's very aware of what sin is. Um, he believes he is a sinner. He understands that sin is more than disobeying mommy and daddy or hurting someone else's feelings. He recognizes that sin is disobeying God and that his sin separates him from God. This may not be on the same level that you and I understand this, but he recognizes that he has a need for a savior. Um, he recognizes that he can't just be good enough to get to heaven. He knows it's only through Jesus' sacrifice that it is possible. Owen's been learning about this and asking about this for the past two years. It's been more than several months. Um, for years, he's been asking about baptism, about communion, about everything here. So he has um, been talked to for, for a while. We go through all the questions with him, who God is, what is sin, what's God plan, God's plan for sin, what is baptism, and so on. He could answer those questions perfectly at four years old. But whenever we got to the part about baptism, he'd say, I'm not ready for that. This week, that changed. Um, he asked really good questions, answered questions in his own words, not just reciting a Bible verse or what he heard in class. He said, I'm ready. This boy has not stopped smiling since Thursday evening. Um, he has been singing and bouncing around, saying, I'm a child of God for the past three days than saying, I wish it was Sunday already. Um, we asked him if he just wanted to go ahead and get baptized and get it done Friday morning. Um, and his answer was no. I want to do it on Sunday because I want all my church friends and family to be there when I do it. And any of you who know Owen, and as you just witnessed, you know how shy he is. Um, he spent the last two days telling others about his decision, inviting grandparents to, to come down um, and celebrate with him. He's been a perfect example of finding joy in Christ alone and having a childlike faith. It's been a privilege to, to watch just how genuine and how joyful he is, and we're just we're so excited to celebrate. We've been praying about this for before he was born. <laughs> so celebrate with us. This loves me. Mm. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so.